Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And let's begin our class of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, again, we are so thankful for you, and we rejoice in all that you have provided for us. We ask that your spirit will join us, lead us into ever deeper understanding of what Christ has accomplished for us, that we can fulfill your purpose at this time in history. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So we are doing lesson seven in the uh, quarterly Ephesians, and the title is uh, The Unified Body of Christ. And the memory text is from Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, which reads... It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Does this uh, text contain any principle or principles that would be useful in, in how we think of ourselves and, and how we view other people and how we relate to others? Does it say anything in regard to how we should fill various roles and positions in the organization? Is it suggesting that perhaps if, if some are equipped and gifted by God with the gift of prophecy or, or gifted to be apostles, that maybe we shouldn't relegate them to the role of housekeeping or cook? That maybe we should let them fill the role and place them in that role? In other words, is the Bible suggesting that God equips different people with different skills, abilities, talents, and, and when those are consecrated to him and, and people are able to function in those roles that the body of believers, the church, actually thrives and functions better? Is that what this is saying? So what is the principle then that Scripture is teaching for us, if we want to use this principle, to decide upon in when we select people for different positions. What's the principle? Isn't it their qualifications, abilities, giftings, talents, experiences? Does the Bible teach that if we place people in the position of leadership based on race, such as Jewish converts, get affirmatively chosen for leadership positions in the new church over Gentile converts because they're Jewish. That's the biblical principle? Or did the church choose people based on the way the Holy Spirit had gifted them and the abilities and the, their qualifications to fulfill the role? If the, if the church at the New Testament would have affirmatively chosen Jewish people because they were Jewish not because of their ability, and put them in roles over Gentiles because they were Jewish, what would they call that, that affirmative approach? <laughs> I think that would be called affirmative action. I, I just point, that, point, out, I point this out to show you that the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world are not the same. They don't work on the same principles they don't work on the same methods. God's kingdom works on objective reality. Some people actually are better musicians than others. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to... Some of us, if you went to a meeting and had some of us perform special music, our heartfelt godly praise would drive people from the meeting. It's true. I don't think that would be a good reason. Uh, in other words, the Bible actually teaches the principle that our gifting, our skills, our talents, our, our, our drive, our application is what is to be deterministic in how we select people for different offices. And, and we don't use irrelevant criteria that have no bearing on the position. Like race has no bearing on the position at all. It doesn't matter. Anybody that is gifted, regardless of whether they're Jew or Gentile. Female or male. Female or male. Exactly right. Paul makes that very clear. There's no Jew or Gentile, male or female, free or slave. Right. Economic position doesn't matter. Where they're from. Where they're from, national or it doesn't matter. Only the ability. And this is where languages come in. It does matter if I'm talking to an English-speaking audience whether I can speak English. That actually matters. <laughs> So what happens, though, if people become dissatisfied with their position, with their current state status? 
and begin to compare themselves with others. Is comparing ourselves with others a good approach to things? No. No. Could that lead to envy and jealousy and backbiting and complaining? And, and are those things, those things, well, those things are not a function of love. Love is not self-seeking. Love is, does not envy. Right. So anti-love would seek to make comparisons amongst people for the purpose of instilling dissatisfaction and jealousy and envy and create groups that are pitted against each other. That's anti-love which is evil. How many Christian groups are there in the world? Yeah, 41,000 at least different Christian groups. Wow. Yeah. And have we seen activities in the world, and the world does not operate on the principles of God, but we have seen activities in the world that goes against the principles we're reading in our Bible text today, our memory verse, that place people in position not based on qualifications, but based on things irrelevant to the position. Have we seen that? Understand that these politically motivated practices are designed and intended to cause division, to create various affinity groups, to be exploited by the self-proclaimed champions of that affinity group. I'm here to help you get your cause because life isn't fair to you because of this, that, or the other thing. It is not actually about helping those people. It is about empowering a few, a few, few people and keeping division. That's what's really happening if you have the discernment to see. This is how the kingdoms of the world function because all the kingdoms of the world are based on Satan's motivations and principles which, if you remember, Satan's method is he sought to rise over, to exalt himself to the throne of God so he can rule over the masses and all of the world's kingdoms of the world have a few ruling elites that tax and exploit and enslave in various ways the masses for the benefits of the elites. These are how Satan's kingdom works. God's kingdom, equality with God was not something for Christ to hold on to. He surrendered it all, all the way down to the cross for the purpose of uplifting the masses. Completely opposite principles. Yes. Do you say? Do you would we would say then that Christ, that God treats people in unequitably une, un, or unevenly? So, so God values and cherishes every human being with equal value and worth. He died for every human being. He provides his love, his grace, his mercy, his spirit, his presence, his power for every human being without regard. He is no respecter of persons, as it says. However, God gifts people with different gifts. So we are not all gifted, as I, as I said, I am not gifted with the gift of you know, musical skill. Now, I'm not tone deaf, but I am not a musician, <laughs> okay? And you wouldn't want me to be your music leader at your organization. That doesn't make me evil or bad. It just simply means I should not be put in that role or position because that's not my gift. You look at the Old Testament when they came out of Egypt, he gifted certain people with craftsmanship skills to fill certain roles, which was clearly different than the gifts he gave Moses. Moses wasn't to be in there as a blacksmith hammering out the various sub, uh, materials for, this, for the sanctuary they were building. That wasn't his role. And so if we have to make the distinction between valuing every person equally for redemption and valuing every person to fill every job or role, you wouldn't want me flying your airplane. <laughs> You wouldn't want me, I'm a physician, you would not want me doing open heart surgery on your loved one. I'm not skilled in those skills. Did uh, God create Lucifer different than the other angels? I mean, he was talked about being the morning star, the top. So my understanding of Lucifer's creation would be that Lucifer is the, the son of the dawn as it says in, I think, 
that's the Isaiah or Ezekiel. Meaning he was the first created being that God made. That's what I understand it to mean. And then he made more angels after him, but he was the very first created being that the Godhead created. That's how I understand that. And, and in that position, he had more time and experience because he was on the scene before the others in the things of God and was in that position of a covering cherub able to leave God's presence and share his personal knowledge, experience, uh, and give of himself what he's learned of God to others, and that built his relationship with them. So he wasn't substantively different. He was experientially different. And we have different experiences, don't we? Yes. So Satan constantly seeks to get Christians to exchange the kingdom of God for the kingdoms of this world by seeking to make artificial rules that differentiate us based on irrelevant elements. And the methods of the world, when they are applied, always result in some form of exploitation, abuse, dysfunction, inefficiency, and conflict, division. They always divide. So as Christians, we cannot allow the lies, perversities, distortions, corruptions of the world into our minds and hearts and practices. We can't go along with falsehood because we fear what others might think of us. We cannot accept any lie into our operations of how we govern ourselves and how we live our lives in the treatment of others. We cannot accept any lie, even if it's presented under the umbrella of being compassionate or loving or fair. We must live the truth. We all have equal value, but we're not all equal in abilities. And I would add that we would not want a, say, socially promoted individual doing open heart surgery on us either. You know, the qualifications matter. So when we surrender to Jesus in faith, we trust him with the outcomes. We know that he sees a million variables. When, when we apply for some position, we don't get it. We know that he sees a million variables that we do not see and are not aware of. And so, so he is protecting us, leading us if we trust him in the path that is best for us. That if we could sit in heaven and see the end from the beginning and all the things that he sees, we would not choose it differently. And so we say, thank you, Lord. While I can't see the reasons things have gone this way right now, I know that you are good, and I know that you have your hand over my life, and I know that you just protected me from something that I don't even know what it is. How good you are to me, Lord. Keep leading in my life, Lord, and open my eyes to see the next step you'd have me take. Then we're not jealous when somebody else got the promotion we didn't. If we have surrendered ourselves his leading. Or if you, rather the simpler version from The Sound of Music, whenever the Lord closes the door, he always opens a window. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday's lesson. The lesson goes on to say that when we're converted to become part of the body of Christ, there is unity that is experienced. We practice the virtues that result in unity. And they list three virtues, humility, gentleness, and patience. And I wanted to talk a little bit about humility this morning. Uh, the lesson states in the third paragraph, Paul elsewhere explains the term humility, lowliness, by adding the idea to count others more significant than yourselves. Humility then may be understood not as a negative virtue of self-deprecation, but as a positive one of appreciating and serving others. Amen. Okay, I, 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 I like that idea very much. And as I thought about it and reflected on it this week, it came to me that humility is the fruit or the outgrowth of God's law, his living design laws being applied in the, in the heart. The big three, love, truth, and liberty. And I just want to show you how if you have those operating, at least humility. When you love, the law of love is in the heart. We are not arrogant. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. It is not prideful. It doesn't seek its own way. This is, this is what love does in 1 Corinthians 13. We respect the individuality of others. We have a desire in our heart for their welfare, for their development, not to use them to get ourselves promoted. 
that's, and we have love in the heart. That leads to humility. What about truth? We have truth, the law of truth operating in the heart. We realize that we are finite. And no matter what we think we know, we only know in part. And that's also in 1 Corinthians 13. For now we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. We know in part. Our understanding of other people's lives is limited. So we don't judge other people because we don't know all their circumstances. We, give, we choose to give the benefit of the doubt. When we see someone else's actions and, we, and they're objectively wrong, we have grief in our heart for them because we know they're harming themselves. They're searing their conscience. They're hardening their hearts. We don't think the worst of people. And we remember the old saying, because we were born with the same sin condition, but for the grace of God, there go I. We're humble. We're not arrogant. We don't throw stones. And then liberty, the law of liberty, remember the Sabbath, the day God rested. And, and, and get your mind around this. The big thing that I've come to recently, that what makes the Sabbath different than all the other days, is what God did. God ceased using power on that day. The day God refused to use force to make Lucifer obey. Think, you're, think that through. He, there's a war going on. He did, the day God ceased using power. He didn't coerce. He didn't force. He didn't make them bow. He didn't make them kneel. He refused to impose laws. He refused to punish disobedience. And we live out God's law. We don't take, when we do, we don't take the arrogant position that we know what's best for another person. We don't seek to force another person to obey the rules or the way we think life should go. We present the truth in love, but we leave them free. We would never, if we are practicing the principle, if we have humble, if we're humble, we would never take the arrogant position that we actually know what's best for another person's life. We would never presume to judge someone who eats meat because we don't know their physiology and their genetics. We would not be so arrogant as to believe that we know what medicine is best for another mentally competent adult to take. And we would never use our power, our position, our authority to press or, or coerce people to take experimental medicine. <laughs> because we think we know what's best for them. We remain humble enough to recognize we can't make that choice for another person. That's what humility is. Do you understand the arrogance that most of the people of the world were duped into, into participating and practicing with their neighbor under the guise of, I love you enough that I know what's best for you. Here, do it or else. I can't tell you how many, how many articles in church magazines and pastors went on to say, if you love, you'll, you'll do this for other people. It's not love. No. It's a counterfeit. Yes. One of the verses that really helps me in the humility department when I need it is, uh, I, when I very often need it, is Isaiah 26, um, I think 12. Lord, you established peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. So when you think of it, everything in your life, the ability to get out of your bed in the morning, the ability to do anything, to do your job, to live, to breathe, is from somewhere else. Okay. And so that thought humiliates me. You know, I think, well... Humiliates or humbles? Oh, humbles, humbles. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it humiliates me when my behavior... It humiliates me when my behavior is not like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, Isaiah 26, 12. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, it says, Isaiah 26, 12. Well, Monday's lesson, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, uh, reads, There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called... One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The lesson points out, Paul lists seven ones. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Seven ones, they emphasize. The significance of the seven. Perfection. Perfection. Spiritual completeness. 
completeness. It is the com- so I think Paul using the seven is saying that in Christ we have spiritual wholeness, spiritual completeness, spiritual restoration, unity and oneness with God in a complete and total way that is achieved uh, through our surrender to Jesus Christ. But I'd like to go quickly through the, the seven ones and let's see if we can understand a, a little insight into what these seven ones are. The one body. What is the body? The body of Christ, which is which denomination? <laughs> it's the unknown church. Oh, it's not a denomination. It's a good point. It was pointed out 41,000 different Christian various groups, okay? And none of those individual denominational sectarian groups represent the actual true body. Is that right? They're, the body w- will have members in every one of those groups, most likely. Praise the Lord. Who is a part of the one body? The church. Who is a part of it? Who? Maybe I should say, how does one become a part of that body? (laughs) Are we a part of the body of Christ simply by being born into the world? Or does it require some additional experience or change after being born into the world to become part of the body of Christ? Have to be born again. Have to be born again. Born again. That's right. Have to be born again. So there's a change, a, a conversion of the heart away from the, the selfish, fear, sinful motives towards a new heart that loves God and loves others. Have to be reborn. Yeah. Are there other Bible metaphors that describe the body of Christ besides the metaphor of the body? How about the vine and the branches? Oh, yeah. Priesthood of believers. And the vine, oh, priesthood of believers. Good. Yeah. The vine and the branches, another way of describing a family tree, so the family of God would also be a way of describing the body. And then the sanctuary, the temple. We are living stones built together in a house for the Lord. These are various different ways to try to describe this idea that when we accept Jesus into our life, we we are connected in such a way that we become living embodiments of his, his spirit, his principles were transformed. We become united in a way that we weren't united before. One spirit. What is the one spirit? Truth. Holy spirit. Somebody said the Holy Spirit. No. The one spirit. There's one body, one spirit. Nobody, no, nobody else? No other thoughts? So certainly the Holy Spirit. There's no question it's the Holy Spirit has to be involved. There's no, but could Paul mean more than just the individual member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit? Could Paul, when Paul wrote in Corinthians, what did he mean when he said in 1 Corinthians 5, 3? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. Or when David wrote in Psalms 51, 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. Could the one spirit mean that when we are converted and have the experience and renewal of heart from the Holy Spirit, that we are reborn and have new hearts and right spirits? Mm -hmm. We have one spirit, a united spirit, a spirit of love, honesty, integrity, loyalty, faithfulness, uh, that we are united in spirit by the Holy Spirit. One spirit. (laughs) John 17, when Christ said, I pray that they be one as you and I are one. So I, I want you to really think through that, that idea of the one spirit. It's more than just the individuality of the Holy Spirit, that we have a united spirit, a united attitude of love and faithfulness and integrity and so forth. One hope. What is the one hope? Jesus Christ ultimately the is the one hope. The spirit is the same. I mean... God the Spirit. So everybody that has that has that unity then. Yes, because we because our hearts are changed. Because we love what he loves. We yeah. hate what, what he hates. And what do we hate? We hate dysfunction. We hate pain. We hate suffering. We hate death. We hate harm. We hate breaches of his design law. Like doctors hate disease. Or dentists hate cavities. <laughs> <laughs> so one hope. Jesus Christ is the one hope for our salvation, yes. Is there any hope outside of Jesus? And so other Bible metaphors for the one hope, the narrow path, the single one gate into the sheep pen, the one mediator between God and man, 
One Lord. Who is our one Lord? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Jesus is our one Lord. So, the, But the question, when you say that, d- does it pop in your mind, but what about the Father and the Holy Spirit? Is the Father and the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, are they our Lord? They're one. They're all or, or, so are they our Lord, or, or is just Jesus our Lord? They're all one. They are one, but are they our Lord? Because <laughs> they're all together. So or is Jesus Lord in some way that the Father and the Holy Spirit are not? Yes. So, He's one of us. So I'm suggesting, I'm not suggesting any difference in the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are united in, in their divine uh, attributes and function and so forth. Oh, but is there a functional, objective, reality-based distinction in what Jesus has done? Some action, some achievement, accomplishment that Jesus has taken upon himself to complete and has completed that places him in the position as our Lord in a distinctly different way than the Father and the Holy Spirit occupy. That's true. Does God's kingdom, the kingdom of his objective reality, require human life to be in harmony with his law yes. if you're gonna if we're gonna have life did jesus take on the role and responsibility of becoming a real human being and as a human being using his human abilities to confront and overcome satan and sin and restore god's perf- perfection back into humanity did he do that yes. yes he did sinless human being achieved in the human being human nature of jesus christ so has Jesus become the second Adam, according to Scripture? Yeah. Yeah. The second head of humanity. Yes. Right. So then, Jesus is our Lord, our liege, our champion, our king who sits on David's throne and reclaims earth and all of its dominion from Satan and places earth back under the sovereignty and governance of a human being. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. So Jesus is our Lord in a way that our allegiances as human beings go through him and, of course, ultimately we give glory to God and the Father. But I think there's an aspect where he now has taken and redeemed the purposes in which God created Adam to fulfill. The human liege or Lord of this planet. What do you think? Am I stretching? (coughs) One faith. What does the one faith mean? Is it suggesting something beyond? Pardon. Can I just make a comment? You know, in in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, he says that the power that raised Christ from the dead is the power that he puts within us according to the working of his mighty power. So when you, you talk about what Jesus gave us, was that power that raised him from the dead gives us the power to live in life like him. And, and what was that power? Well, the power that Jesus gives us. Since we're going to go there, this is great. I love it. You're right. What, can, can we be more precise about what that power is? Be more precise. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, if I can get this right, Paul a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle uh, and appointed to the gospel, uh, the gospel he promised beforehand through uh, his, his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his human nature, he was descended from David. And who was declared, no, no, who was declared by the Holy Spirit with power by his resurrection from the dead to be Jesus Christ our Lord. So the the power of his resurrection is the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the power Paul is referencing here that transforms us. And Jesus promised his disciples that when I go, I will ask the Father and he will send another. And so there there is a power that Jesus gifts us and it's the power of the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead, according to Romans, I think it's 1-3. So beautiful. 
It's yeah. the power of the restoration to God's original design. That's right. That it gives eternal life. And the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, we're not going to get to it in the lesson. It's in the notes. We're not going to get to it. Um, too many notes. <laughs> but, but the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, um, when I go, I will, I will ask the Father, he was in a comforter. And then when the Spirit comes, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. Think that through. It's just so amazing when you think about the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Okay. Just so unusual. So he, he comes, he comes, yeah. he doesn't speak on his own. So who's the Holy Spirit listening to? He's not speaking on his own, he's listening to somebody else. Yeah. He's listening to who? Jesus. Jesus. He's Jesus' representative. Yeah. And so he's listening to Jesus, and Jesus is in heaven pleading, <clears throat> pleading his blood before the Father. Not pleading his blood to the Father, pleading his blood before the Father because he is carrying out the Father's purpose. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. And so he's before the Father, carrying out the purpose of the Father to plead his blood, which is his self-sacrificial life, perfect life, and all these things that he's done for us. And the Holy Spirit is listening and taking those pleas to who? To us. So we have the Holy Spirit pleading in behalf of Christ, let me save you. Don't you know how much I love you? Don't you know what I've done for you? Don't you know I can heal you? Will you just let me into your heart? I stand at the door and knock. If you open, I'll come in and it'll transform you. And then when he does, he says, Jesus said the Spirit will take what is mine and make it known to you. So once we hear the pleadings of Jesus via the Spirit and open the heart, then the Spirit takes the perfection of Christ and reproduces it in us, and we are resurrected into a new life where it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. We have new hearts and raised spirits. Yeah. So this is what you're saying. And then all the glory goes to God. Yes. Amen. Amen. And now yes. why adds to that that if it weren't for the influence of the Holy Spirit, we would, none of us would have benefited from the death of Christ. Right. She says that the, um, the, the Spirit makes effectual in the sinner, what the death of Christ has uh, worked out or achieved. Yeah. Without the Spirit, it would not become effectual in our lives. And he comes with no, he comes with the full divine power of God, which raised him from the dead and raises us from the, the life of dead in trespasses and sin. So one faith goes beyond, in my view, simply our individual personal saving faith, that we have a common belief we have a common understanding of who God is, who Christ is, his, how his design laws function, the principles and methods that, that his kingdom operate upon. We have a common unity that Jesus prayed about in John 7, 17. One baptism. What is this one baptism? Is this referring to ceremonial water, which is often preached about? There's one baptism, and it's dunking. Is that what it means? Well, let's, let's ask some questions. <coughs> Does a person have to be baptized ceremonially in water in order to experience salvation? No. Do we have examples of that? Thief on, the Thief on the cross is the classic example, and that's correct. Any others? All the Old Testament. Enoch. How about Enoch? <laughs> Wait, straight to heaven, right? And, and, and a lot of times you start throwing uh, Old Testament names out, which I do, uh, Elijah, Daniel, and others. Some people will point anybody who's descended from, uh, anybody who came out of the descendants after Egypt will point out that Paul says that they were baptized when they went through the Red Sea. Okay? So the whole nation got baptized at that point. So everybody else was baptized. So they'll use that as an example of that. So, but Enoch didn't do that. Naaman didn't do that, and others. So, no. So the text is not referring to the ceremonial water. But what, is, but what the ceremonial water represents, that represents some reality. And remember, metaphors, object lessons, metaphors, are only metaphors if they're connected to and enlighten you about reality. If they're disconnected from reality, they become fantasy. So... The, the metaphor of the, of the water baptism is to teach us a reality. What's the, what's the reality it's teaching us? Dying to self. Dying to self. Okay, that's true. But it, the metaphor is, is being buried, submerged, dunked, washed, and rising again. So are we immersing, and, and the bap, bapti, baptize word is a, is a Greek word that actually means to immerse. If you read literature of the day, when women would wash their dishes in the sink, they would baptize them. They would immerse them in the water to wash them. 
That's what, that's what and, and, and King James was sprinkled in the King James Bible, and, and the translators didn't want to get in trouble with the political powers. And so rather than saying immersing, they just transliterated the Greek word baptismo into an English word, baptized, and allowed people to have some ambiguity there. But it actually means to immerse. So the object lesson of immersing, that's an object lesson. What's being immersed? Heart. Hearts and minds. And what are we being immersed into? Truth, Truth for sure. The living water, the wellspring. Of the living water represented the baptism of the, the Bible actually talks about it, the baptism of the Holy Spirit where the self, the inner heart and mind, is immersed and washed clean by the presence of the Holy Spirit, where we die to fear and selfishness and we rise with a new heart, with new motives that, that the Spirit brings, achieved for us, ultimately by Jesus Christ, but applied in us, the Holy Spirit. We have to be submersed. You can't have salvation without being immersed, having your heart and mind immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's cleansing. That's renewal. That's rebirth. And then one God and Father of all, does that mean that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are not God? No, it means that in the Godhead, that each of them, amongst their own wisdom and selves, uh, decided to take different aspects or roles in how they create and govern and deal with their universe. And the Father has taken the position of being the supreme source of all. The last paragraph says, Note carefully two ideas about the unity of the church. First, unity is a spiritual fact rooted in the seven ones of reality to be celebrated. Second, the unity requires our zeal to nurture and grow. There will, be, there will often be causes to weep at our feelings in, the actualizing, in actualizing this unity. However, whatever our feelings, we should rejoice in the work of God in Christ in unifying the church, rejoicing in the theological reality of the unity of the Spirit. Doing so will empower us to return to the hard work of advancing this unity, but, we'll f but with fresh conviction that in doing so, we are accomplishing God's own work. How do we achieve unity in the church? Can we ever achieve, achieve unity by imposing a list of rules? No. It can look like unity. If it cannot be achieved in this way, what would it, so are, are y'all can, we have a list of rules and we authoritarily force or coerce people to keep them. Can we get the unity that Paul's talking about? No, no way. So we're convinced that can't happen. Then what would it mean if people tried to get unity that way? What would seeing people use that method mean to you? They don't, they don't understand God's law. They don't understand God's law. That they're pursuing unity through rule enforcement is an evidence of immaturity. Immaturity. Not understanding reality. Not understanding how God's kingdom works. Or as the Hebrews 5 says, the immature of their own milk are not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Yes? Why do so many leaders that claim to know the Bible and study the Bible and then lead people in those... She says, why do so many leaders do this? Yeah. You know the answer to this question. This, que this answer, the answer to this question has been presented in this class for years. I ask it repeatedly. What? No, you know the answer. You already know it. No, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're going to give it to us right now. What is the, what is, when you ask all these, what's the first question we ask? So why do people then do this? Because? They don't understand design law. That's right. They, so what law, do, what law are they operating on? Imposed. Imposed. Yeah. imposed rules. So this is when you have imposed rules and you believe God's kingdom runs on imposed rules, then imposed rules require enforcement and you use authority. Is it because they've heard that all their lives and they, I just, it just it's seems human like, nature. Yeah. It is how sin works. Yeah. It's how Satan's kingdom works. It's driven by fear. When you're in fear, you want to feel safe. 
And how do you get to feel safe? By getting more power than yourself. You want to be stronger, wealthier, in more control. You want to be able to dominate and force. You want to be able to set the rules that everyone else has to obey. You want to have the power to punish those who don't obey. You can feel safe this way. And so this is the ways of the kingdoms of the world, which are driven by survival of the fittest. The strong survive, the weak are dominated and killed. And they don't realize that, some of them. No, and, they, and, they, and they, because they see, God as, they see God through the false lens of Satan's lie about his law, and they believe he's ultimately supreme, and so ultimately in the end we win because he'll punish them all and make them all pay. So talk about a little bit about... Uh, I'm about to get to my point, but go ahead. The Israelites and all their rules, and death, 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 death. And this is what they... I mean, talk about that and how it relates to uh, imposed law. So that question comes up in the Q&A time. Somebody's posted it. So we're going to save that for the Q&A time because somebody's asked that question about stoning and those types of things in the Q&A time. So I'm going to, I'm going to finish this point here. Can, can, we, can we, it's about trying to achieve unity in the church uh, regarding the, that, did they achieve unity in Israel by all those laws? So that would be a good historical example to show that putting laws and enforcing laws did not achieve unity. So we can achieve unity in this way, and the point I want you to see is if you see this happening, it's an evidence that at best, the most gracious way is that they're immature. It's not that they're against Christ, but they're children. They're immature, infants in Christ, and they don't understand how he works yet. And so people can be converted with good hearts, like a small child, and do things like a small child would do it, but they're not God's way of doing it. So we're not going to say they're against Christ, but it's certainly not God's way. And, and the church can't grow and mature that way. In the book Angry Saints, written by George Knight, and this is a historical review of the 1888 General Conference um, uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you haven't read it, it's actually quite interesting reading. He describes the conflict that happened there with, with good historical references and quotations and sources. And the two sides that were opposed were the righteousness by faith, Jones-Wagner side of things, who presented that the law in Galatians that was added was the Ten Commandments. It was, it was not a representation of God's government. He doesn't make up rules and enforce them. We have actual real righteousness where, like, like the Bible says, that was the righteousness by faith message versus the, the legal church leaders led by Butler who took the position that the Ten Commandments are imposed and eternal, and they are rules that require enforcement. This is the two signs that were happening in 1888. Now, he goes on to describe the history that repeatedly, mul multiple times over the 1886 to 1888, for a two to three year period, Butler, who was the General Conference president, continued to try to use his office and rally um, votes in the conference to vote orthodoxy and force the church and everyone to teach what he thought was right. Repeatedly, this happened. Repeatedly, it was opposed by Ellen White. Authority of office, coercive pressure to silence. They wanted to censor Jones and Wagner. They wanted to silence them. Don't let them present it was attempted. Stop their publications it was attempted. We heard anything like that in the world today? There's nothing new under the sun. No, then that's what happens when your position is not based on truth. Jones and Wagner didn't do any of that. They simply, they came and said, here's what we're understanding. We, and they actually presented it and invited critique. Show me where we're wrong. Show me, because we only want to follow godly truth in Scripture. If we're wrong, show it to us. And let everyone be persuaded in their own mind. The, so, and our church has never recovered from this, folks. So the big elements were righteous by faith, Jones and Wagner, versus the declared legally righteous, even though you remain unrighteous, legal people. The... Law in Galatians that was added was the Ten Commandments versus the law that was added was ceremonial law only. And Jones and Wagner opposed authoritarianism and wanted simply to leave people free, present truth and love and leave people free, versus use the authority of office to silence and expunge from membership those who don't agree with us. And sadly, the uh, church has never recovered from this. It still teaches the penal legal view that you're declared righteous even though you remain unrighteous. It still teaches this idea that the Ten Commandments are eternal and imposed and requires God to punish. And it still 
has legalistic leaders that continue to use the authority of their office to silence, intimidate, enforce their dogmas. And this then has created in the organization what's known as a selection bias. A selection bias is when your rules select out and eliminate from the body voices that question what you think. The Jewish nation selected out Jesus and the apostles. They had a message that the Jewish leadership did not like. They were then branded heretics. They were imprisoned. They were persecuted. They were driven out from fellowship. And the Jewish nation ended up in darkness. The Adventist organization is doing the same thing. We get letters from all over the world about people who share this message that we have in their local church where they've been members for years. And they will frequently find themselves told, you can come and you can certainly pay your tithe here, but you can't teach anymore. <laughs> you can't teach. You can't hold office. And eventually they're driven from fellowship. And what this, what this does, it's a selection bias that who's left in leadership and in membership yeah. have an illusion of unity. It's an illusion. What they have is authoritarian uniformity. Anybody who questions, out you go so we can be unified. Yes. So these 27 fundamental 28 now, but yes, 27, 28 fundamental beliefs, yes. So if this person says, no, I don't agree with all of these, they would not baptize them? Uh, so certainly they would not. That is true. That's not true. There, I know churches where people have stood up and said, but I don't believe numbers such and such, and they baptize them anyway. But they don't get membership in the church. I, I think so. Yeah, yeah I, I don't the know that happening. The church votes that. Pardon? The local church votes that. Yes, yes. That's a, that's a different question, ultimately. But, but the way it works in practice, I will tell you, the way it works in the New Testament church is when somebody gives their heart to Jesus Christ, they are baptized at that moment. Mm. Philip with the eunuch. Right. There's water. What's the delay? Let's yeah. baptize. And they baptize them. Yeah. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized on that day when they were converted. Cornelius. Yeah, Cornelius, exactly. What happens in most, in most Protestant churches that I know of, I won't say all, but most that I know of, is that when there's an evangelistic series, when the gospel is presented, when somebody is converted and gives their heart to, to the Lord, and they come down... Something is substituted for baptism. What is it? Aquinas. The sinner's prayer. Do the sinner's prayer. Accept Jesus as your... And then, after the sinner's prayer, you're enrolled into indoctrinational classes. <laughs> you are. You're, you're enrolled into classes. Those classes will go for weeks. And in those classes, if you're in the Adventist system anyway, you'll be educated that before you can be baptized, you'll need to give up your Sabbath job. Unless it's for health care, then you can still work it. Okay, uh, you'll, you'll, need, you'll need to give up pork. You'll need to give up alcohol. If you have an addiction that's more serious, it's not, uh, you don't just drink alcohol with your meal twice a week. You actually have an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction. You'll need to get in rehab and get into recovery before you can get. You'll have to get victory. In other words, you're put in this system where you have to conform your life to the, what the organization says is right before you can be baptized. This is not Christian. No. This is a system of works. It destroys the joy and the love of Jesus, and it disempowers people. Because what empowers people to have victory over sin in their life is the indwelling Christ. Holy Spirit. Mm. And so, um, Tim, one more. yes. When I was <laughs> when I was married to her dad, and was going to be baptized, they told me that I needed to take off my wedding. Yeah, day. me too. I was going to say that. So that's just another one. So, so the, back to the question of baptism then. Does, the, does that mean, because we've talked about the, the, the baptism by immersion is just symbolic. It's not the actual saving baptism. That's the Holy Spirit. Does that mean the baptism by immersion, though, is unimportant and unnecessary? It does not. The, uh, the ceremony is important. It is part of the process of how we choose in action and governance of ourselves to solidify in our being the truths uh, and new life that we have in Christ. So how this works is that 
you first have baptism of the heart and mind and the Holy Spirit that brings a person to conversion and cleanses their heart and they're reborn with new heart and new motive. Then, with their new heart and their new motive, they want to live and witness for Jesus Christ to tell people. And so the baptism, a public baptism is a way for them to take a public stand and to begin to practice and to demonstrate in action they're willing to follow and do what Christ has, has instructed for us to do. And it helps solidify in them the practices and the primary practice is not the practice of being immersed, the practice of following and witnessing for Jesus. Doesn't the public stand um, release, you're, you're releasing yourself here because you have all these things that, embarrassment or whatever, and you're releasing all that. I don't know. That's what I... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've been baptized more times than I care to admit because I was always in this state of never feeling cleansed, never feeling that I was, you know, united with Christ. It wasn't until the night I was born again and had come out of a year and a half of just bitterness, anger, resentment, all of this stuff that was consuming me after my divorce. It wasn't until that day when... I heard the Holy Spirit for the second time ask me to let my wall down just a little bit. I couldn't even handle let it down all the way. It was just a little bit. I'll come in and give you rest. I had no clue what that meant. But I welcomed the invitation because I was bankrupt in here. And, that, and that's the baptism. That evening, yeah. he had me write a letter to the people that had hurt me most. And this time, there was something different. I just wanted to show love. And when I started writing this letter, something broke loose inside of me, and a dam, like, broke. And for the next hour, I had the darkest emotions, the darkest experience of my life. And halfway through this process, as I'm sobbing and just not understanding what's happening, I think God's left me. And I said, I thought you said, I'll get, you know, I'll take care of this. But then about an hour into it, as I think, I'm, I'm losing my mind here. I'm going to lose it. And an hour into it, I'm sitting there on the commode, and all of a sudden it's like everything stops. And I had a calm inside and a peace. I didn't even understand what it was. But I had a peace inside. Now... As far as coming to this class and understanding that my sanctuary was cleansed, that Jesus did a work in me that I couldn't do for myself all that time. And I had peace for the first time and have been pursuing it ever since. And that's the baptism. Yeah, thank you for that. So can we achieve the unity in the church through public attestations to a common creed and a list of fundamental beliefs? Can we achieve unity by exercise of external might and power? <clears throat> through legislation. How about through a church vote in general conference session? If we have a, a vote in general conference session of what the orthodoxy will be, will that bring unity amongst all the members? <laughs> or compliance committees. Is, and so there's a difference between unity and uniformity. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would all be one, as he and the Father are one. And is there something taught in Scripture, part of God's original design, that is, is intended to teach us this unity? How about marriage? Did God create Adam and Eve as two separate individuals who were to become one? Yes. Have a unity? Yes. And today in this sinful world, even though we have sin in the world, can a man and a woman who have re been reborn in godly love come into unity and experience the oneness that God designed. Can they still do that? Yes. And, and can the marital unity, which is going to teach us unity, remember the, the, there's, there's a lesson in Scripture, uh, in fact the metaphor is used of, of Christ the groom and the church is the bride, so this is a very biblical object lesson, isn't it? Okay, so can the marital unity that God designed be achieved through force, through rules? through laws, through threats, through punishments, through external pressure, through declarations, through a common list of doctrinal attestations, through a belonging to the same denominational system. Can any of that bring the unity no. that God designed? No. None of it. So how is it that two separate individuals 
become united, one as God designed in marriage. How's that happen? You love the other person more than yourself. You love the other person more than yourself. Love the that's the very next words in my notes. You were reading my that's exactly it. <laughs> love the other person more than yourself. And then in that love, the two unite their individualities upon common heavenly principles in which they value, cherish, and esteem the other more than themselves. They rejoice and invest in the success of the other. They get gr- real joy in doing for and uplifting their partner. They know that the other, they know the other intimately. And each partner is trustworthy, reliable, mature, and has the best interests of the other at the forefront of their motives. They are united, they're a united team, and yet they retain their individuality, their unique gifts, talents, abilities. They rejoice in their differences. They learn to share in the other's preferences. They give each other real freedom, and both are enriched in this process. In our relationship with Jesus, we must love him more than ourselves and value his design laws and methods and principles and then love each other and uh, love others and rejoice in the successes of others. We don't compete to try to outdo other people. Unity does not mean uniformity. Nor does it mean there are never any loving disagreements. Differences of opinion or heartfelt discussions. Consider Abraham disagreeing with Jesus over the destruction of Sodom. Moses disagreeing over the destruction of Israel and creating a new nation with his children. Paul, if you may, you, you may remember, Jesus sent a message to Paul more than once, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul disagreed with that message. He was warned that if he did, he would be bound, tied up, and killed. And he went anyway, and he was bound, tied up, and killed. Did that mean because he didn't listen to the warning that he and and Jesus were, Paul and Jesus were no longer one? They weren't united? They weren't friends? No, didn't mean that at all. They disagreed. But Paul's motive was love. He wanted to save other people. He was united upon the principles of God's kingdom. He was willing to sacrifice himself for others. Do we have any examples of any group or nation that had unity the right way? I mean, Israel and our church, he shows up in marriage now, that's a new idea, I mean, new concept, but uh, what about a group of people? The church, Jesus said, is the wheat and the tares growing up together until the harvest. So you have converted and unconverted in the same organization, so they will not have the unity. What common is there between the between the pure and the and the unholy and they're growing up together? So no, not organization. But I wanna I value my wife because she has her own mind, her own individuality, her own perspectives. I I would not want somebody as my spouse who was only my shadow and only and always agreed with everything that I say and think in detail. That would be boring. There would be no depth, there'd be no substance, there'd be no interest. My life is enriched and more interesting because Christy has her own mind and way of seeing and doing things. Now, it is true that I don't always agree with everything she says, and she she doesn't always agree with me. Good for you. And I've learned to listen to her, to consider her insights and perspectives and counsels. And I am a much wiser person today because I have learned from her, and I would be less... And our marriage would be less if either one of us surrendered our individuality to the other. I love you and thank you. Well, Tim, also, the the person that we're married to is the person who knows us best. Mm -hmm. And that's always an opportunity for character building. That's right. Oh, it's exactly right. I'm improved because of my wife. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. Boy, there's so much more good stuff I wanted to get into. Let's see what the key elements... um, there's just a little point, a little, I think, a point of interest for me, and that is uh, I'm talking about Jesus descended and then he ascended, and when he ascended, he, he took captives captive and, and, uh, and gave gifts to men, and, and I like to think that 
those captives that went with him were the first fruits that were raised with him. And you know the text in Scripture in Matthew 27, 51 to 53. At the moment of the temple, uh, the temple was the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, tombs broke open, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So there's a, there's a resurrection that happened at, at Christ's crucifixion. And I, certainly I think some of those people, some of them, were people who died during the lifetimes of the people there. So, so they would be recognized and be witnesses, some of them. But I like to think that some of the people raised at that time was an answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17, 24, when he said, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see, me, see my glory and glory, the glory you've given me because you love me before the creation of the world. So I like to think that at least some of the individuals raised then were also some of his faithful friends through time that get to go back early, like Noah, ne uh, Melchizedek, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, David, Elisha, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and others. I like to think. I, I don't have any proof of that. <laughs> but I do have in Revelation 4.4, 4, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. Dressed in white is the white righteousness of Christ, the robe of Christ's righteousness. The crown of gold is the crown of victory. There's 24 thrones here. We've only been named three, Elisha, excuse me, Elijah, Enoch, and Moses that have been taken to heaven. There's at least 21 more human beings that have gone to heaven. I like to think that maybe those are some of these other great heroes of Scripture that are with Jesus in heaven. I, I, yeah. We'll get there, we'll know for sure, but, but I, I think that might be true. And then we, we've talked about the Holy Spirit a little bit already. Let's see if there's another point I wanted to make. Yes, uh, in the lesson, on Wednesday's lesson, it talks about the different types of gifted people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then, and then pastors and teachers. And they say pastors and teachers are kind of together. Apostles, uh, most Christians believe and uh, use this term for those who were directly instructed by Jesus himself. So the 12 apostles and Paul, who was directly instructed by Jesus himself for three and a half years in the wilderness. So most people will not consider themselves an apostle today. Evangelists would be people who primarily take the gospel to people who don't know the gospel to present the good news and bring them to conversion. Pastors and teachers are people who are helping the believers who've already been converted grow in their personal journey and, and mature and grow up and become more effective in the body of Christ, pastors and teachers. But what about the prophets? Who are the prophets? That's what I want to say in a little bit. About. I think you'll get excited about this. In, in the Bible, there, the prophets, at least the way I was raised, I had this idea that was actually very restrictive of the definition. It is a true, but it's, it's too restrictive. The restrictive definition that I used to have is a prophet is somebody who's had a vision and or has been given a prophetic um, vision of the future or a message, a, a, a prophecy, okay? If you, you have to have a prophecy, to be a, a prophet. That's how I viewed prophets, like John, who wrote Revelation, or Daniel, who wrote the book of Daniel. They had visions, and they wrote prophecy. And that's how I thought. And they are prophets, but that's a restricted definition of, of a prophet. I want you to recognize uh, out of uh, uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. It says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land, the sea, and the tree until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Who are the servants of God? And this goes through it really quick. There's a couple slides with multiple Bible references on it, but the servants you will find in Scripture is Ezra 9.10. Uh, For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets. Jeremiah 7.25. Uh, For from the time your forefathers left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets. Amos 3.7. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. 
Ezekiel 38, 17. Uh, are you not the one I spoke of in the former days by my servants, the prophets? Daniel 9, 7. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Zechariah 1, 6. But did not my word, my decree, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, take your... And, I'll, and, and Revelation itself says this, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. I'm making the case that the people who are sealed, the 144,000 who get the sealing before the four winds loosen, are actually God's prophets. They're his servants, the prophets. And what are the prophets? Well, there's the prognosticator prophets, and then there are the spokespersons for God, the people that are sent by God with a message for the people at that time. And God is calling for people at this time to stand up with an end-time message of the three angels set in the setting of the design law message to stop worshiping an imperial Roman dictator and return to worshiping the creator whose character and government operate on the law of love. This is the message, and he's waiting for his people, symbolically represented by the 144,000, to be sealed, settled into the truth and election and spirit, so they cannot be shaken, that they can be his end-time spokespersons, and from their witness, a great multitude will hear that message and be saved when the four winds begin to loosen. So I encourage you, become a spokesperson. A spokesperson for God. Speak the truth about his kingdom in this world today. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, for your watch care, for your mercy, and we ask that you will seal us, settle us into your kingdom, that we can be truth bearers, witnessing the true kingdom of heaven in this dark world that is, has accepted a Roman impersonation of how your government runs. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Short. Thank you.